Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhillslv.com to watch or listen to past messages. We hope you enjoy today's message from God's Word. Welcome back to week number two for Clear Answers. What an incredible Sunday we had last Sunday. And now you're back to hear a very special guest speaker, Ben Shetler is back. Now this is probably his third or fourth year in a row being with us. We're so glad to have him back. And today he's gonna be answering the question, why does evil exist? These bad things that happen in our lives. And we're gonna be talking about that from a biblical perspective. Oh, be back tonight at 6 p.m. where Ben is gonna be also giving a presentation called, Can You Prove God Exists? Very exciting full day event for Clear Answers Sunday. Now, I present to you, Ben Shetler. Oh, good morning. I was, I was crawling over the choir to get out here, and it is awesome to be back at Southern Hills. Who's just glad to be at church today? Some of you are sad you didn't come to the first service, so you didn't get a donut off the wall of donuts. Some of you don't come early enough to know that there is a wall of donuts. Do you know outside those planks that are empty when you came in? They used to have donuts on them. And people that love themselves more than you ate those donuts rather than sharing with you. Oh, well. Hey, I, I'm, I'm honored to be here today. Uh, as was mentioned, um, my name is Ben. I run an organization called the Center for Truth and Love. We've changed our name since last I was here. And the reason for that is because I see in our culture a problem of Christians that want to be loving. And of course, that's not a problem. But they use the world's definition of love. And the world's definition of love says you can't talk about certain issues. You have to be silent. How many are familiar with that? Like the world kind of says, well, this issue, we can't talk about that. Or We can't say anything about that because we have to be loving. Well, that's just a bad definition of love because real love speaks the truth in problematic moments, right? And uh, so what what I see is some Christians want to be loving and so they're silent. But then I see another group of Christians that speaks. And when they speak, I wish they would be silent (laughs) because they're so unkind with the way they speak. Have you ever seen that before? And, uh, and so we have these two extremes, but the Bible talks about culture as being like a ship tossed to and fro, back and forth, with every claim to truth. And if you look at 21st century American culture, that's what you see. Uh, you have people that don't know what a man or a woman is. You have people that don't know what marriage is. You have people that don't know what love is, what human identity is. We're so confused about so many things, and we're like this ship that's being tossed everywhere. And in the middle of those problems, the Bible doesn't say just to speak truth. The Bible doesn't just say, well, just be loving and don't say everything. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians 4.15. He says, but speaking the truth in love. That's what we need to do, isn't it? It's that we speak the truth, but we do so in a loving way. And so that's why I love the fact that Southern Hills has a clear answer Sunday. The whole goal in we, last week and in this week is to equip you to speak the truth in a loving way. And uh, there are challenging objections that happen in our culture. And uh, so the other reason why Pastor Josh has me come and the team has me come is to connect you to our organization. And we would love to equip you. We, um, we uh, create digital resources. Our first one is coming. Well, actually, we have one out right now called The Curious Conversation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that if you're able to come back tonight. But that's just a short two-minute video that answers challenging objections on, uh, on Facebook and on Twitter in that format. So it's really helpful. That's on our website. And then um, we, we create some other digital resources that are coming out very soon. I'm excited about that. We have a television show that uh, is syndicated on Christian Television Network, and we're hoping to get that airing here in Las Vegas uh, soon. Um, So I'm excited about that. And then we do Sundays just like this. So we're going to jump into the Word of God. Now, wasn't that singing incredible today? Wasn't that, oh man, wasn't that great? That was phenomenal. I enjoyed it. And you know what I loved about that is how much it emphasized the victory over the grave. Have you noticed that? Like the truth that this world is broken. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you uh, went through this week and you had a problem this week? Anybody, Anybody here have a problem this week? Anybody here have a lot of problems this week? Anybody sitting next to your problem? No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, problems are challenging, aren't they? Now, now, let me ask a more serious question. How many of you, you I, please don't raise your hand, but just, just in your life right now, you could honestly say, man, Ben, I, I know we're laughing here, but man, I've I got some real problems. 
I mean, there, there's something real going on in my life. There's something that my accountant just can't wave a, a, a magical accountant wand over. I, I got some financial problems. I, I, it's challenging. And I just lost my job. Man, there's some things going on in our marriage, and I, I may not share that with anyone here, or maybe leadership of the church to get some help, but man, man, there's some challenges. Man, I've got a son or a daughter that I care about. Man, there's some medical challenges, and there's, there's challenges in our world, and you say, Ben, I've got one of those today. And if you're sitting there and you don't have one, just keep breathing, because it's coming. How many are old enough to know that? How many are old enough like me when things start going like really, and I'm not saying I'm old, but when things start going well, you get a little uncomfortable. You're like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, things have been going well. It's been like three weeks and nothing bad has happened. (laughs) Because we live in a broken, fallen world. And how many of you like me, there's days where you'd like, you know, if I were God, I'd just get rid of all the problems in the world. You ever been there before? Well, then we start to ask questions like this. Well, then why, and I'm going to scoot this back, but why would God even allow evil in the world? And so let's go to our first slide here. Why, what about evil? Where did this problem come from? Why is there evil in the world? Now, I want to give you a, a couple things. Number one, if God got rid of all the evil, I'd love for God to get rid of all the evil. Would you still be here? You know, it's interesting how when we say, God, why all this evil? Why did you allow evil? If you have all power, and here's our two questions. God, if you have all power and you're all loving, if you have all power, you could get rid of the evil. And if you're loving, you'd want to get rid of the evil. So then why would a God with all power, who's all loving, either he doesn't have the power so he can't do it, but he wants to, or he has the power and he doesn't love us, uh, either one. But why would that God allow evil? And here's another question. Why is there so much bad in the world? Why doesn't God get rid of it? And if we're being honest, these are the questions we wrestle with. And here's what I want to challenge you with today. Some of you are at the place in your spiritual journey where it's kind of a casual Christianity, where it's like, hey, I go to church, you know, we go a couple times a month, and, you know, we give a little bit, and, and, you know, we we pray for a missionary from time to time, and, and I may read a book from here to there, but it's very, very casual. But God isn't calling us to be casual Christians. God's calling us to enter a deep and real relationship with him. A gentleman by the name of George Barna, who is uh, is said to be the most quoted man in modern Christianity. He's a researcher, which is why he gets quoted all the time, because they take his stats and say, Barna says this or Barna says that. I got to interview him a, a few nights ago for our television show. And he, one of the most significant research projects he's done in his career, he interviewed 17, him and his team, 17,000 people. Now you think of a stadium of 10,000, add seven to it. I mean, it's, it's absolutely incredible, this undertaking. And they, they kind of charted people's spiritual journeys. And what they found was in step four, they said, you know, the early steps is a recognition of sin. Step four was a a salvation experience. And step five was kind of a casual Christianity. Step six was like kind of going to that next level. But then step seven was brokenness. I don't know if you've ever reached that point where God has allowed something to happen in your life that hurts and you break. And he says it's really the defining moment of mature Christianity because what they found is as most Christians, once they, once they hit step seven of brokenness, one of two things happens. Either one, they just walk away from the faith completely. Like, well, you know, if there really is a God and this is what, I, you know, I didn't sign up for this, I'm out. Or two, they kind of fall back to that casual Christianity and they kind of unplug a little bit. They, they, they were moving forward, but then, then they kind of just step back. But he said, if you can get past that step of brokenness, he said, the next step is surrender. So what we're going to talk about today is that moment where I say, God, I realize that there's brokenness in the world. God, I realize that there's challenges, but God, I'm willing to trust you. I'm willing to place my trust in you, even in the middle of the brokenness. 
He says, once you get past that point of brokenness, you come to a point of surrender. And once you surrender to God, he said, step nine, this is a 10-step thing. He said, step nine is falling deeply in love with God. A deep and real love of God that you almost can't explain. Paul says it's unspeakable, this authentic, real love for God. And then out of that love for God, you're able to love other people. You know, we all say we love other people, but people aren't very lovable, are they? And those of us that are optimists, we, we try to find the good in people, and that's typically what we do as people, is we look for the good to love in people. But really, if the curtain were pulled back on all our lives, there's a lot of not good in our lives. And God calls us to love people not because of the good we find in them, but because we are loving them the way he loved us through us. Does that make sense? And so today, today, you know, when I come, it's like, oh, Ben's coming. He's going to have some funny stories. And some of you don't even know who I am. I come every year. And I gotta... But today is, is a little more challenging of a message. But I think it's good because all of us walk through difficult things, don't we? All of us have challenges. And so we need to discuss this. Why is there evil in the world. Well, we find the source of evil in Genesis chapter 3, and we find that it's actually not God that brought evil into the world. It's these two people, Adam and Eve. And in verse 3, or in verse 1 in Genesis 3, the Bible says this, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Hey, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, Ye may eat of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now if you're new to church, you may have never heard this story before, but it's a classic story of Adam and Eve, and it's found in the Bible. Now I use the word story, but this is a real narrative. This is what happened at the beginning of the world. God created Adam, God created Eve. You say, well, how do you know there's a God? Well, I hope you'll come back tonight, because we're going to discuss that very issue. How can we know that there's a God? What evidence exists. But, but this morning, assuming that God does exist and he created the world, these two people, Adam and Eve, were there. And there was a tree that God said, you can eat of all the trees save one. And this was a moment of choice. And so Adam and Eve, they made the wrong choice and they both ate of the fruit. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, I'm in verse six, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave unto her husband with her and he did eat and the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And so, so down in verse 16, God, God gives out the punishment because sin must be punished. And he says, here's what's going to happen because of this in verse 16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception and sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Now we find, if, if you're curious about how this works out, we find that Eve listened to the devil who's deceptive, but Adam knew exactly what he was doing and still sinned. I always think it's funny how we blame Eve, but Adam knew what he was doing. This was an Adam deal for those of you that want to know. Uh, but, but thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. So in other words, there's this curse and this problem. And so because man sin, there was evil that was brought into the world. So we're going to look at this today. Let's ask for God's help. Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us into truth, and that God, that you would help us as we examine this idea and these brief points today, that God, we might wrestle, that we might think, that we might, might be challenged with the truth of your word as we ask this question, why is there evil in the world? I thank you for the truth of your Bible and how it challenges us in life. I ask that you'll be with us during this time. In Jesus' Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Now, I grew up in Florida. I now, uh, I now live there. And uh, when I was a little kid in Florida, we'd go to the beach. And after we got done playing in the water, what do you think was the first thing we did as kids? What do you do? You get done playing in the water, what do you do? 
Build a sandcastle is the correct answer. <laughs> I thought you were like, oh, what was he looking for? I don't know. Uh, build a sandcastle. And so I remember one day, I was about five years old, I built this incredible sandcastle, and uh, it was epic. And so I ran down the beach. I wanted my mom to see this incredible work of my building hands. And so, you know, I had the moat and all the, you know, all the other things around it. And so I ran down the beach, and she's reading a book there. And I said, Mommy, Mommy, can you come see my sandcastle? Now, I don't talk like that now, but when I was a little kid, you know, it's fine. And uh, she, you know, Know, just hang on a second. I'll be down. And, you know, I can see it from here. No, mom, it's amazing. You got, you, you, you got to see my sand castle, mom. You know, and and she's there. No, no, I'll come in. You know, finally, you know, that whiny voice prevails. And so mom comes out. Now I'm the oldest of three boys. I have a younger brother at the time named Luke. My brother Drew was not born yet, and my brother Luke is. While I was a great builder, he was a great destroyer. And Luke had discovered my sandcastle, and he had been implementing his destructive skills while my back was turned. And so I turn around, and there I see my brother. Now, what is my attitude towards that? Hey, brother. I love you so much. Thank you for destroying my sandcastle. No, it was like this. There was like music beginning in my brain. Do, 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 do. And I began to move in slow motion in my mind down the beach after my brother. And in my mind, I was going to arrive at him and not greet him with a kiss. Oh, no. Right? That's my attitude. What are you doing? Now, wouldn't it have been an interesting conversation if both of us as mature adults were discussing this? And he said, well, you knew it was going to get destroyed sometime. Why bother to build it in the first place? Shut up. <laughs> Who were you as the destroyer? to tell me, the builder, what I'm supposed to do with my creation. Hello? You getting this? See, this is the foundation of the problem of evil. You didn't make you. God did. And who are we to tell God that he made a mistake? when we were the ones that ruined the world he created to begin with. But let's look at this, because is it possible? And so today I want to give you a few things that will challenge you. Let's go to our first slide. Uh, tonight, if you come back, let me give you a little motivation tonight. Uh, we're going to discuss some things from our, this is one of the conferences our organization does. It's called the Y Conference. And everyone that comes tonight, or every family at least if I have enough, will uh, get one of these booklets. It will actually have the notes for today on it. I didn't have enough to give to everybody, but you'll get these tonight. I can also email these notes if you would like them. Uh, but I'd love for you to come back tonight. Uh, and then we'll also discuss some more in here. But I'm going to go through six or eight things, excuse me, just really fast. They won't be long. Number one, if there is evil, there must be a God. Now, oftentimes this is, as we're talking about speaking the truth in love, and you want to be equipped to answer this question from your coworker, your friend, or your family member that goes, well, if there's a loving God, why would he allow evil? Well, number one, understand that you can't have evil without having good, because evil is a contrast of good, and you can't have good unless there's an absolute standard of good. In fact, the atheist worldview has a far more problem than the existence of God. How do you even account for bad things happening? A little while ago, after the shooting here in Las Vegas, you remember that a few years ago? I was discussing about that shooting with an atheist online, and I remember she said, well, man, if your God has power, why didn't he stop this? He's such an evil God. And I said, if there is no God, how can you be sure what happened is actually evil? Now, follow the logic here. I'm not making this statement. I'm saying follow the logic. And the logic is, is if there is no God, who's to say that that's evil? In fact, you could make an argument. Once again, I'm not making this argument. But you could make an argument that that's a good thing because humans pollute the earth. So maybe we should just destroy them all. I'm not saying we should, but do you understand? I'm using the logic here. 
And so here this woman, here's what she said. She goes, well, I can't tell you that what was, and I asked her, well, do you think what happened in the shooting, do you think it's actually evil? Before you go accusing God of being evil, do you think it is evil? And she said, well, I don't know if there is such a thing as evil. See, there's a problem with the worldview because if there's evil, that means there's good. And if there's good, there must be God. C.S. Lewis, the Chronicles of Narnia, some of his other work we're very familiar with in the 21st century. C.S. Lewis in the 20th century used to be an atheist agnostic. He came to Christ and here's what he said. He, He said, I used to not believe in the existence of God because of all the evil in the world. But then I started wondering, how do I know what evil or good is unless there is a standard of good? He said, how can someone call a line crooked unless they have an idea of a straight line? And so really, our first question is, if there is evil, there must be God. This is not evidence for God. Now, I will say, this is a tension in the Christian faith, which brings us to point number two. A transcendent God will not be able to be fully understood. Now, I was talking about, you know, I'm a little bit of a thinker, and it's okay. You're going to have to think in church today, but that's good. That's that's what a mature Christian does. And so I'm a bit of a thinker, and so I came up with this, this construct of God. I shared it with one of my friends. His name was Grant. I said, Grant, I came up with this idea. It's called the illog- the logical illogicality of the existence of God. Doesn't that just sound good? And he's like, well, what is the illogical, illogical, or the logical illogicality of the existence of God? I said, here's what it is. First of all, it's logical to believe God exists. We'll talk about that tonight. It's logical. There's evidence. There's things I can look at creation and go, where did this come from? I can look at the world and look at the intricate design and biology and cosmology. All of these things, they point to a designer, a causer. I said, so it's logical. He said, yeah, I agree with that. It's logical God to exist. Well, if God is transcendent, capable of creating space-time, then it's also logical to believe that some of the things he does will be illogical to me, right? So if God is transcendent, I can't understand everything he does. Some of the things he, do, he does, I'll kind of be like, well, I don't get that. So it's logical to believe he exists, but it's also logical to believe that I can't understand everything about him. Does that make sense? Okay, you might have to go back in the live stream and watch again. Once again, you're, you're getting challenged at church today. So I said this to Grant. I said, so that's it. And he goes, you're wrong. I said, well, what do you know? You're a Presbyterian. <laughs> I did say that, but he knew I was joking. And, uh, and he said, here's, here's what I mean, Ben. He goes... While some of the things God does may be illogical to you, in other words, that's the very definition of transcendence, that we can't understand him fully. God is not illogical. You just don't understand him. I thought, oh man, you're right, that'll preach. See, we've got to understand that a transcendent God will not be able to be fully understood. And while this is Clear Answer Sunday, and this is a subject we tackle, I'm telling you this one issue, the problem of evil is what apologists call it, this one issue is something that we don't have clear answers for. I don't understand why God does all the things that he does. Now, I know that he exists, but I don't understand all the things that he does. And a transcendent God is not going to be fully understood. But let's go to point number three. Point number three, allowing evil and creating evil are different. I kind of mentioned this in the sandcastle illustration, but I'm always amazed when people are like, wow, look at God, how how he caused all this evil in the world. And when I even look at the world, isn't it interesting, our culture in 21st century America, how everything good that happens to the individual is because of the individual. And everything bad that happens to the individual is because of God. Have you, have you noticed that? Even atheists become theists when bad things happen. Oh, how, how could God have allowed that? See, I'm not an atheist. Because I don't believe, because this is terrible. How could God allow that? And it's amazing when we have good, we're like, yeah, look, I got that promotion. Yeah, I got that raise. Yeah, I raised these kids really good. Yeah, I did all this. And it's amazing how the good we attribute to ourselves and the evil is God's fault. Does that seem logical to you? That's how we are as people, isn't it? So allowing evil and creating evil are different. Let me give you an illustration. Um, Do you know that God has created a book or written a book so that we can know him and know what to do in our lives? You know what I'm amazing, how how is amazing is how often we sin against this book and go, God, what did you do to me? 
We don't get God's way right, and then we blame God for going the wrong way. Let me give you an illustration. I, uh, uh, back in the day, I don't know if you remember this, uh, Apple had like a, a campaign series. I think it's about 10 years ago now. There's an app for that. Do you remember that, that campaign? Like, there's an app for this. And so they're talking about there's an app for this. So there's an app for everything. And uh, so nowadays, there really almost seems to be an app for everything. So I take my phone and I go and uh, try to save my condo association a little money on cutting the grass. And so I'm like, I'm going to cut the grass. I'll find an app for that. I don't have a lawnmower, but I'll just find an app for that. I pull up a little app and it's like a pair of scissors going like this. I'm like, that'll work. I go in the yard and I start, you know, cutting the grass with my iPhone with this picture of scissors going like this and, you know, cutting grass. And you drive by and you're like, man, Ben, that, that humidity and heat in Florida, it's kind of like Vegas. You, you lost your mind in this heat. Let's go get some ice cream. Come on, take a break. And you're like, what do you know? I was like, oh, I have an app for that. And you're like, no, no, that's not how the phone works. You know, you could get an app and have someone come and mow your lawn for you, but the, the phone itself is not supposed to cut your grass. It's not what it was designed for. So we go out to ice cream, and you know, I like the ice cream place where you weigh it. You're, you've been, you know, oh, yeah, you just, you pay by the pound. Now we're talking. <laughs> then you pay by the pound, right? You pay by the pound, and you pay, you've been there before, yeah. So, <laughs> so you go there, you get the ice cream, and, and they got, you and I go, and you're like, man, you're hot, Ben. I, I want to hook you up here. And uh, so I'm going to pay for your ice cream. So you pay for mine, but there's one spoon left. And I say, hey, you know, I'm not really down to sharing spoons. I mean, I love you in Christ, but, you know, you take the spoon. I'll find an app for that. <laughs> so I pull up my phone. I get a little picture of a spoon on there, and you're eating your ice cream. I'm over there going... You're like, oh, man, you've lost your mind. Now, I'm not using, is an iPhone a terrible device now? Because it doesn't scoop ice cream or because it doesn't mow your grass? No. It's because it's designed for other things. And if you use it correctly, you won't have problems. Do you know the Creator designed you very specifically? And it amazes me how we blame the Creator when we use His creation the wrong way. Isn't that true? Allowing evil and creating evil are different. Let's go to the next slide. I'm going to uh, sandwich these together just for sake of time. God brings a limit to the effects of evil. And then this next one is God brings a finality to the devastation of evil. Do you know, in our world, we get so sidetracked that this is all there is. Do you know there's something coming? There's a day coming where there's not going to be evil anymore. Hello? There's a day coming where there will be no more evil. That the resurrection that Jesus came out of the grave, yes, we're waiting. The Bible says for the whole creation is waiting until that day where the king returns, that glorious day where it comes again and evil will be no more. Booyah, Grandma! I'm sorry, I get excited sometimes. God is bringing an effect that it is going to end. You ever notice this with a child? When they have to go through a little bit of pain to, to come out on the other side, how much they squirm. You know, put a, a child on, on a plane and fly him to Orlando to go to Disney World. Oh, they hate the plane until they get off. They see what's on the other side. Do you know what? The effects of evil in this world are real. I don't want to diminish those, but it's for a short time, for eternity and eternity and eternity. God is going to outpour his blessings on us. And I love what the Bible says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. God would not be a good God if he continued to allow the effects of evil on us forever, but there is a limit to it his redemption through Jesus Christ. I have a brain injury, and there's a lot of things that I can't do. In fact, my eyeballs hurt right now looking at all these screens. It's just how it is. It's how I live. I had a friend a little while ago ask me what the prognosis is, and I've been dealing with these issues for three years, and I've been progressing, but it's kind of hit a plateau. And uh, he was asking me, you know, what's the doctor say or whatever? And I said, well, well, James, I said, it looks like I'm just going to be stuck like this forever. Everyone should be so lucky to have a friend like this. You know what James said to me? He said, not forever. Can I tell you, if you're going through something today, not forever. That God brings a limit to the effects of evil. 
that while man is responsible for bringing evil into the world, I'm telling you, there's just a present time, but the sufferings of this world will not be able to be compared with the glory that God is going to be revealed, not forever. Number six, as we, as our time, contrast provides understanding. We cannot know love without hate, peace without turbulence, and good without evil. So, you know, the devil was right when he said, you'll see things the way God does. Now, he was, I would say he was right. He was partially right. Do you know that the evil that God allowed in the world has given us a, a, a more robust understanding of him? That, that imagine the most peaceful place you've ever been in your life. You know that in contrast to all the turbulence in your life, right? Imagine some of the most, the deepest love that you've experienced in your life. You know that in contrast to the hate that's in our world, isn't it? And so that contrast provides this understanding. And once again, I know I'm rushing through this. When we get to the end, I'm going to give you a, a link to a resource um, that you can get that really digs into this deeper. But let me go to the most significant of these points, and it's number seven. I think it's important for us as Christians, and that is this. God is capable of using evil for a good purpose. Now, we often say, say this, and look at this sub point here. God never wants us to pretend like evil is good. God doesn't put his, God doesn't have his blessings wear camouflage. I think sometimes as Christians, we've adopted this into the church, that we have to pretend like everything that happens in our life is a good thing, and that it's somehow a blessing in disguise. And I can tell you, there are bad things that happen that God is not calling you and I to call good about to go plant a church. There's going to be bad things that happen. God's not calling you guys to go, well, let's just pretend like this is good. It's evil. So the Bible says there's a spiritual warfare that's going to happen. You know what's great about a church in Reno? is that there is light that can be given because bad things are going to happen to you, but bad things are happening to every person in that community. And I sat there this morning as you guys were talking, in, in the first service, I was back there in the second service, but in the first service, I sat there as you were up there, and I just prayed and said, God, would you use this church as a light to people that are hurting? Because there's many in Reno. Do you know not every person that puts a, a quarter in the slot, they don't all win. There's a lot of losers. I don't know if you know that, but, but they don't build those buildings off the, off the winners. See, there's a lot of hurt in our world. See, aren't you thankful that this is a church that doesn't just love themselves, but loves Reno, Nevada enough to send some people there? Aren't you thankful for that? I am. I won't go there, but it costs money to, to plant a church in Reno, Right? Yeah, so you got to, yeah, okay. I just, I just was wondering, I don't know if you found a way to do it for free. If you do, let me know. <laughs> but, but we need to support them, and, and that's what's great about, about uh, Southern Hills, is that this is a church that supports them. But you know what? It takes way more than money to do a spiritual work. Can I say that? That as they leave today, I, I hope you'll walk out today and shake their hand and tell them I'm praying for, the, for you, and those not be empty words. I, I digress. I'm sorry. I got a message to preach, and I was over here talking about it. But I'm excited about what God's going to use you guys to do. I, be, I believe he's going to use you in a great way. And we as a church need to get behind that, right? All right, so back to the point. God is capable of using evil for a good purpose. I had a brain injury a while ago, I mentioned. I go into all the details of that. It was, it was hard. I'll never forget the Sunday my wife trying to get, you know, all kinds of problems, sleeping 14 hours a day, the eight hours that, that I was awake, I was spent in a dark room. I couldn't go anywhere where there was light at all. Like we had the whole, like everything was blacked out, just in a black room, just black all the time. I remember one Sunday morning, Mackenzie tried to make breakfast. She's like, you know, I've, we've tried everything. We've been to every doctor that we can imagine. She's like, I'm, we're just trying to fix this. We'll have a good day. And I remember sitting down and she's being really nice to me and I'm trying to eat. We were trying to have a conversation. I, I couldn't even think clearly enough to have a conversation. I'll never forget. I looked over here. I said, I, I, said I, ju I just can't do this. I remember walking out of the house. And those were dark times. Those were difficult times. 
Well, do you know how God can use that for good? That later that day, Mackenzie started praying, and she'd been praying before, but like never before, God led her to a doctor that was able to give me some help and to, to start mending some things along the way. And my wife will say this. She says, since I've gone through this challenge, I've been more empathetic and more loving. She says, you're a better husband now than you've ever been. And I was really good before. You can ask me. <laughs> See, this is where Christian maturity comes in, is when we have something that comes into our life that breaks us, and we say, God, I surrender to you. That God, it hurts. I don't have to pretend like that miscarriage is, is something that's good or that the cancer, whatever God is bringing into our life, that that's good. We don't have to pretend like it's good, but we can know that like a craftsman who uses a tool to build a thing, that God can use evil for a good purpose. I don't know if you ever have interpersonal uh, conflicts with your siblings. But there's a guy in the Bible named Joseph, and his brothers sold him into slavery. It's okay. You know, you got a sibling. They didn't sell you into slavery, so you're good, you know. <laughs> they sold him, and they put him in a pit, sold him into slavery. He winds up becoming the second most powerful person in the largest government in the world in Egypt at that time. His father dies, and his brothers come to him and say, Joseph, please don't kill us. He could have had just a simple decree, all of them executed. They said, please don't kill us. He said, guys, you don't understand. He said, you, what you did to me was evil. You meant that to me for evil, but God used it for good. I don't know if you know about the story of Joseph, but God used Joseph to save his own family in the known world at the time from famine because of a dream that God put in Joseph, placed him in Pharaoh's house, all because his brothers sold him into slavery. Was that a good thing? Certainly not. But God was able to use that for a good purpose. And I'm telling you, I don't know what's happening in your life right now. You may be hurting. You may be going through something difficult, but I can tell you, God is bringing you to that point of surrender where you say, God, I don't understand. God, it hurts, but God, I am trusting you. I'm holding on to you. You remember what Jesus said to doubting Thomas. He said, there's coming a day where people won't even see me alive from the dead, but, but they trust me. And that's, this takes us to the last point. He said they're more blessed because of that. Number eight, I must exercise faith. This is a challenging thing. Some of you may say, man, I've got a child that's away from the Lord. I've got this challenge in my life, but ultimately, why do bad things happen? You know what the answer is? Let me give you a clear answer. I don't know. Is that clear? He said, I don't know. You know why? Because I'm not God. And he's transcendent. But I'll tell you, my God is a good God. Now, I really dropped the ball in the previous service. Because I gave all these points and I forgot to say the most important one, which is this. God has a solution for evil. If you're going through something difficult, it's not forever. Why? Because God sent his only son for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. What's that son's name? He died on a cross. He rose again. He conquered sin and death, squashed it. The Bible actually says in the book of Genesis that the serpent's head would be bruised by the heel of the Messiah that he conquered sin and death and God created a solution for evil. You say, Ben, do you understand why? Man, I feel like I could give some things that help to make sense, that God can use evil for good, that evil doesn't last forever. But at the end of the day, I don't know everything, but I do know that God is a good God and he is worthy to be trusted. Do you know in the book of Job, everything bad that's ever happened is ha somebody happened to Job. Finance is totally destroyed boils all over his body, some of the most pain you could possibly be in, and all of his children die. And do you know what God says to Job? Where were you when I created the world? Where were you when I made the peacock? Where were you when I made the eagle so he could see far away? Where were you? And he goes through this list of all the things that he had did. And can I tell you something? I'm not the creator. You're not the creator. So trust God. One day, we will stand before the king of the universe in all his glory. The Bible says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If you don't know him, get to know him 
Some of you may need to have an encounter with him. But one day we will stand before the king in all of his glory, and one of two things will be true of you. Either one, you'll move past point seven to point eight of complete surrender where you can fall into deep love with God and others. Or two, you'll stand before God a little embarrassed that you didn't trust the king. That's not easy. Some of you are walking through stuff right now. We got real today, didn't we? But you know, I can tell you God is good and God blesses. And you see the end of the book of Job, that God brings blessings into Job's life. And I believe that God brings fruit after pain. I really do. So hang in there. Great days are ahead. The king is on the throne. And I'll tell you, I'd much rather have him driving the car than me. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will challenge us with this thought that we must trust you, that you are the king, that you are on the throne. With heads bowed and eyes closed, let me ask a question today. How many of you would say, Ben, I need to trust God? This message wasn't as froofy as some of my other ones. I love to tell tons of stories. This, we just got to the meat of it today. But this is mature Christianity where we step up and say, you know what, Ben? I need to trust God with my Sundays. I need to be here every Sunday, not just some. Ben, I need to maybe take a step in my finances. Ben, I need to not just toss some, but I need to give. You say, Ben, I need to trust God for my friend because I want my friend to be saved. I want him to, he or she to come to Christ for my family member. And Ben, there's something I need to place in God's hands today and I need to tell God that I trust him on it because I've been trusting me and I'm not getting the job done. How many of you today would take that step of maturity of surrender and say, God, I surrender it to you. It's not my problem, it's yours. God, I trust you. Would you just slip your hand up? Ben, there's something that I need to trust God on. Praise the Lord. Many hands, many hands. Just leave it with him today. Thank you. Anyone else? Ben, there's something I need to trust God on. Thank you so much. You can put your hands down. Who would say, Ben, I've never received Christ as my personal Savior. I'd like to know how to be saved. Ben, I'm not sure that I'm saved, and I'd love for someone to take a Bible and as you leave here today, I can, I can point someone to you. I can take a Bible and show you how you can be saved. Ben, I'm not sure that I'm saved, but I'd like to know. Is there anyone like that at all? Would you just slip your hand up all across this room? Ben, I'm not sure that I'm saved, but I'd sure like to know. Anyone like that at all? I didn't see any hands, but you come, you come talk to me outside after that. I'll find someone if you're not sure. But let's just in the quietness of this moment, would you just have a time of prayer with God and just say, God... I'm trusting you for this challenge in my life. Would you do that? Leave it at his feet. Heavenly Father, we do praise your name and we know that you're a good God. And Lord, while, we, while our finite minds have questions, God, today I want you to, God, I trust you. And Lord, I pray that this would be a church that could say, I trust you. That we would surrender so we could fall deeply in love with you and thereby love other people and fulfill your law and commandments. I ask these things all in Jesus' name. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connectdesk at southernhillslv.com. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhillslv.com slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach God's people around the world. 